previous Bloodhound Supersonic car videos, you will have seen how to build the world's fastest car. Now we've got the car, we've got to test it out. And the next step is about trying to reach that big record. I'm joined by Tony Paraman. Tony, where does the car go now? So first of all, we have to take the car to uh, Newquay Airport, in actual fact. So we need to test the car, shakedown tests, they're basically called, but we need to actually rattle the car, make sure the connections on the car are good before we transport it out to South Africa. Now, South Africa, why did you choose South Africa? We've got the whole world to choose from. It's a pretty long process. So we asked Swansea University to find all the flat places on the planet. And then what you do is you discount the ones that are too high because the air's too thin, the ones that are too low because the air's too thick, the ones that are politically unstable that you just wouldn't want to go to, the ones you can't get to because there's no access to them. And then you come up with about 12 different uh, places. Then what you do is you get married and then you take your fiance uh, on holiday to all those places and you explore them, which is what Andy Green did. That's not a bad way to find the destination for Bloodhound SSC. And finding those places was with satellite, is that right? So Swansea University used uh, Google Earth, Google Planet, as well as using um, satellite data from NASA as well. Now I'm guessing if you're using the world's fastest car, it's going to travel pretty quickly over a short distance. So how long is the stretch that you have chosen in South Africa? So the desert out there is about 12 miles long, about three miles wide. And what we've had to do is clear a strip of that desert from all the stones. So anything bigger than 10 millimetres in diameter has to be picked up by hand, put into a wheelbarrow, carried to the side of the desert and put into a pile. By hand? So that, is that you guys here heading out to South Africa? Uh, thankfully not. I mean, the temperature can get up to about 40 degrees C on the desert. So we've got a team of about 300 115 local people uh, who are doing that job for us which is great and fantastic and it's bringing money into the local economy. So you've cleared the track, well you found your de destination, you've cleared the track, you're going to get out there. What happens on essentially your race day, your record day? So it's a, it's a pretty long process so we'll be out there for about three months so once we get out into the desert we've got to set up a camp for over 40 people. Um, so the team that consists of, of 40 people who are going to actually sort of run the car. But we've also got sponsors, we've also got 1K club members out there as well. So there's gonna be quite a large number of people out there. So we set up camp, uh, we get the car onto the desert. And of course, what we have to then do is, is slowly ramp up the speed because we can't just go out there and go a thousand miles an hour. What we need is to, to start testing at very low speed and then gradually build that speed up. And while we're doing that, Andy's learning how to drive the car. Learning how to drive the car. Well, that is a big feat in itself. If uh, you get the record, mm -hmm. what will that actually have entailed? What do you have to do in order to meet all the regulations for the record? So the car has to stay on the ground throughout the measured mile. So right in the middle of the desert we have an FIA measured mile, so they put out markers and they measure us as we go through that measured mile. And if we should get the record, and in order to do that we have to do two runs, one in each direction, uh, the car has to have been in contact with the desert for the entirety of that measured mile. So they will walk that measured mile to make sure there are wheel tracks throughout it. And can you just do it during the day, like when Andy's ready, you can do each run, or is there a, a time limit? Uh, so you have to do the two runs within an hour. When you do that during the day is entirely up to you. So we'll probably do the runs quite early in the morning or late on in the evening. Uh, that cuts out the risk of crosswinds uh, because we don't want to, to drive the car in anything above 25 mile, five mile an hour crosswind. And we also want to keep the temperature down. So having the car run in the morning, it's going to be nice and cool. But obviously that means us getting up very, very early in the morning to actually get the car prepped before we do a run. Well, I reckon getting up early is worth every minute to get that thousand mile per hour record. What is the reason behind doing it? Is it purely to break the record and to have the world's fastest car? No. I mean, running a car down a desert a thousand miles an hour, great fun. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, this is a fantastic project to be involved with. But really, it's all about education. Uh, we are the seventh largest manufacturing country in the world. Uh, we have lots of engineering companies within the UK, but we're not supplying them with the right quality of people uh, to actually run those companies. So we're trying to inspire the next generation of kids into STEM education. So science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And Bloodhound is the perfect vehicle, if you excuse the pun, for doing that. And I've spied in the Technology Centre some drawings that look not like Andy has drawn the helmets himself. Can we have a look at those? We can indeed. Let's go and have a look now. Perfect. Wow, what an incredible display of colourful helmets. Yeah, uh, what we did, we ran a competition both here and South Africa to design Andy's helmet. And we had a winner in both countries. And so what will happen is Andy will wear 
uh, the helmets on alternate days. So it looks like kids are happy to get involved and want to get involved with Bloodhound. Most definitely. I mean, it's a, it's a great project. I mean, you can't help but be inspired by something that's got large flames and, and lots of noise. I mean, we have five and a half thousand schools in the UK sort of going for the project. And we also have uh, a team of ambassadors, 500 ambassadors, who are taking the project out to those schools and really inspiring that next generation. Do you think in inspiring the generation, do you think we're going to end up with more engineers here in Britain? Oh, definitely. I mean, if you look at the, look at the Apollo effect, for example, when the Apollo missions were on, um, there was this massive spike in engineers uh, in the United States, which the United States are still feeling the effects today. So you're hoping to replicate that with Bloodhound? Oh, most definitely. I mean, you know, we have kids, I have documented evidence that kids have actually made decisions to become engineers because of the Bloodhound effect. Well, it's an incredible project. And just judging from the colourful helmets and the energy that they are giving off, I'm sure this is going to inspire a new generation. We definitely hope so. Bloodhound SSC is the most incredible project. Not only is it the challenge of reaching 1,000 miles per hour, it's the complexity, the engineering, the precision, all inspiring a new generation of engineers. Pole Position is going to be following Bloodhound SSC's progress, so keep an eye on the channel. And of course, if you want to find more out about the land speed record, you can head to Bloodhound's website, bloodhoundssc.com. And he, um, just, he just sits straight in here. There is no... That's what else is going to be heading <coughs> in there? Okay. Yeah, an aluminium alloy. Basically. And that is, is that just because of 